brilliant morning. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Neris up, please, from the College of Policing. Uh, College, a uh, huge supporter of evidence-based practice. Some people ask, what is the difference between what you're trying to do as a society of evidence-based policing and what the college tries to do? And we work really closely together. The college provide all sorts of architecture and support that pushes evidence-based practice. And SCBP is a huge supporter of them, but also works in the hearts and minds of individuals in policing uh, to complement what the college does. So, Neris, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Alex, and thank you for having me here today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Alex said, I work for the College of Policing, which hopefully all of you here will know is the professional body for um, officers and staff working in policing in England and Wales, but we're also the What Work Centre for Crime Reduction. Um, so as Alex said, evidence-based policing is kind of core to our hearts, um, and a lot of the work we're trying to do is building that infrastructure for how we can support policing to use evidence in its decision-making, and also how we can support government and policy to use evidence in their decision making as well, which I think is just as important. Um, so I'm currently um, interim director for What Works, so a lot of my role is about how we support you to use evidence and get it into practice. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the work we're doing um, from about taking innovation, so ideas that you're having um, in forces and locally, um, and scaling that up to what works. Um, and as a nod to Jason, I also agree that sometimes innovation is, seems to be the preoccupation, and we should sometimes be thinking about how we hardwire some of the stuff that we know has got a good evidence behind it into what we're doing on a daily basis. And there's all sorts of other bits of the college that are trying to make that happen um, in relation to things like hotspots, problem solving, and all the other things that we know have got a good evidence base behind them. But this bit of work I'm talking about today is... is, pre is pre what's the word I'm looking for, is particularly focused on uh, looking at how we uh, uh, scale innovation up to what works. So I'm going to start with the what works. I'm starting at the other end. Um, so hopefully all of you here will have seen the Crime Reduction Toolkit. Um, and this is basically the repository that the college has that includes all of the systematic reviews that have been done um, with a crime reduction outcome. And that can be a reoffending outcome, a self-reported uh, offending outcome, a uh, re-victimization outcome, anything that's related to crime reduction and a systematic review has been done on it is included on the, on the crime reduction toolkit. And we're constantly updating it as new systematic reviews come out um, and building the, uh, that resource for you to be able to use. Um, we currently have 76 different interventions on the toolkit, um, including some of the ones we've just talked about, problem-oriented policing, hotspots policing, focused deterrence, which has been um, a bit of a theme already this morning, and restorative justice, just to name a few. Um, the newest one on there is violence and injury observations, which are about using data to help uh, to target interventions relating to violence, and it's shown that where people are using data, multiple sources of data to help with their um, violence strategies, that it seems to have a, an impact on on, uh, violence and reducing violence in the adult population. Um, so do go and have a look at it if you haven't seen it already. Um, but this is where we're trying to get innovations up to. So we're trying to get the ideas that you're having locally, get them evaluated, which, which you're all doing now here today um, and hopefully we'll be doing into the future. And then getting those uh, evaluations replicated so that we can see that it works in different contexts. Um, as Jason was saying, context does matter. Um, being able to then understand the average impact that in event, in intervention is having, um, and then we'll be able to put it on the toolkit and say whether it works or not. And one of the things we're trying to do with the toolkit is actually see if we can expand it from just looking at crime reduction um, outcomes to other outcomes that are important to policing, because crime reduction is only one small bit of what you all do, um, and we're very aware of that. Um, so that's where we're trying to get to. But how do, we, how do we build that pipeline of going from innovation to what works? Um, and this is where we need your support to help us to do that. So we uh, developed the practice bank because... Because that process is needed to get something on the crime reduction toolkit, we need an evaluation, we need it tested multiple times, um, and then we need somebody to pull the results and see if it on, on average works. Um, there are big gaps on the crime reduction toolkit. Uh, there are areas where there's no evidence at all, um, and there's areas um, where actually um, th there are, um, there's bits of evidence, but not as much as we would like. So we developed the practice bank to try and um, pull in from policing and crime reduction partners and others what local practice you're trying 
trying um, in forces um, so that we can actually start to share that and be aware of it much more quickly so that we can then start to um, actually think about which of these innovations look like they're worth testing um, and trying to uh, build the evidence base about what works around. So anyone um, who works in policing or in crime reduction um, in anywhere in the public sector can uh, enter um, interventions onto the practice bank. There's a form there. You can fill it out yourself. Um, it um, allows innovations that have been tested or untested onto the practice bank. So you don't have to have evaluated it. And I'll come on to that in, in a little bit. Um, and it's, it can be, um, it's used by forces and the offices of the PCCs. And we've got some crime reduction partner examples on there as well. Um, it can be filtered by a whole range of things, so you can then look at it yourself to see, are there interventions here that might help me tackle a particular problem that I've got locally? Um, and in the, in the actual narratives, there's quite a lot of detail around how the intervention is implemented, um, what evaluation and impact sits behind it, what learning there is, and key points of contact, so you can go and actually speak to the people who have um, delivered the intervention. So um, it's a kind of really critical... Um, on the wrong slide. It's funny, it shows you they've all on here. There we go. This is what I'm talking about. This is a practice bank. So um, it's a kind of really good resource for, for officers and staff who are trying to tackle problems to think about what they might be able to do locally. But also, if you're doing something good um, and that you think should be shared, for you to put it on there so that others can see it and learn from what you've been doing on a lo uh, locally as well. Um, HMI CFRS are using it to uh, add innovations um, and notable practice that they're spotting in their um, inspections. So that's all being fed through here as well. So it should be a one-stop shop for you to be able to go and look at what's happening across forces uh, to see if it's things that you want to pick up and learn from uh, yourselves. Interestingly, one of the things we're trying to get on the practice bank and have failed so far, so this is a, this is a gauntlet I'm laying to you, um, we have yet to have somebody submit a piece of practice that they tried, and you know what? It didn't actually work. Um, it didn't have the impact that they were hoping it would have. And that's just as important as things that do have an impact to know about. Um, and we just need somebody to be brave enough to put their head against, up above the parapet and say, actually, do you know what? This didn't work, and I probably should share that with people. So they might be able to tweak it, adapt it, or actually, we just don't do it anything else with it. Um, you might want to ask your chief constable if you're going to put something on there that doesn't work though. Going back to this morning's session, they may not be pleased if you do that without flagging it to them first. Um, but we are keen to try and get things on there um, that don't work as well. And we may well start to think about what prizes we can offer for people who are prepared to say that this doesn't work. So um, when Rachel presented on uh, the practice bank at the last uh, SEBP, so that was about a year ago now, um, I think we had 48 entries onto it, um, so it was very new. It launched in March, and it was uh, September, so it was a few, a few, week, a few, um, a few months on. I'm pleased to say that we now have almost 200 entries, and I think we're going to hit 200 very, very soon. Uh, we hit 100 in March, so a year on, we had 100 entries on it. So we've had almost 100 come in in the last six months, um, and we've still got more in the pipeline. So we've got 113 that are in the process that we go through before we upload them onto the practice bank. So that's great. That shows the appetite and policing to share what you're doing locally and kind of put innovations out there and share them with others, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, as I said, we've got examples from forces and examples from the offices of the PCC. They don't all have to be crime related. Um, there are some that are around how you can change organisational issues that you might be having locally. Um, there are some that are about how you might change your kind of control room and your engagement with victims or how you might build trust um, in the public and in communities. And there are just a few examples of the kinds of things that are on there um, at the moment. These are some of the newest additions that we've had. But as I say, they're coming quite thick and fast at the moment. So do, uh, do show your practice there because I think it will um, end up being a really good resource. Um, and so uh, the... The, just a shout out to North Hants, Office of the PCC. Um, we have got some examples from the Office of the PCC, but they are pushing through a lot of innovations. So just trying to generate a little bit of competition. If you work for an Office of the PCC, you want to, you want to battle North Hants um, and get some more on here because um, it will be great to see them. So... What's the point in having uh, these innovations shared? Um, well, partly it's so you can see what others are doing and use it for your own advantage locally in your force. But the other bit is that we want to be able to spot uh, innovations that have um, the uh, look like they have a wider application across all forces, um, so they're replicable. 
They're addressing priority policing areas, so areas that we know we've got a real struggle with at the moment and we need to improve in, um, and uh, areas that we know can be evaluated. Um, and so we were trying to develop a pipeline for taking the examples that you're giving us through the practice bank through a process of testing and replication to then be able to put them onto the What Works um, uh, toolkit. So we've set up a What Works board uh, that's chaired by um, Alex Marshall, who's our CEO, CEO in the college. Um, it has representation from HMIC FRS, the MPCC, so Gavin Stevens sits on it, um, the APCC, the Home Office, um, and the Police Chief Scientific Advisor sits on the board as well. Um, and they are considering uh, innovations that come through the practice bank and making decisions about where we want to put funding to either evaluate those innovations because they haven't been evaluated um, in the first instance or where they have been evaluated, where we want to put funding into replicating them and evaluating them again so that we can start to understand how they work in different contexts and be able to start to say some strong statements about whether they work or not. Um, so this is a process that we've, we've kicked off last year. Um, so the team in the college goes through the innovations on the practice bank, and there are, as you say, they're increasing, so it's going to get an increasingly big job. We also source them from the Office of the Police Chief Scientific <coughs> Advisor, who tends to go out and find technological solutions that are being used at, in forces at the moment as well, which we're also trying to get put on the practice bank. And we assess them against the criteria that I mentioned, but also um, making sure that we're confident they won't have a backfire effect if they haven't been evaluated. Um, and then we take them to the boards uh, for discussion and decision making. Um, and so we've had a number of sessions now where we've taken some of the practice bank examples to the board for those decisions. Um, and I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the uh, work we've been doing around evaluating and replicating them. So the first round um, of, of this whole process, the first time we've done it, um, identified uh, three uh, areas, three in innovations that we uh, were going to, or the board wanted us to go and do a little bit more work around. Um, so these are them uh, briefly on the screen now. I'll go through them. I'll probably focus most on the improving core management summary assessment and response um, piece. Um, but uh, they are in slight, they're in very different areas. So the, the improving core management summary assessment and response, or SAR for short, um, is tackling uh, the core handling efficiency. So how we can be more efficient at dealing with calls um, when they first come into the, to the force. And I know this is an area that a lot of forces are dealing with at the moment. And I know it's an area that HMIC FRS are picking up uh, quite a bit um, uh, in terms of uh, where forces think they think forces can improve. So this was a piece of innovation that was being um, done in South Wales Police. Um, and they were having trouble with calls being picked up in a timely way and meeting their targets for calls. They were also having challenges with calls being uh, regraded once they'd been graded by the call handler, um, by the dispatcher. So um, there were a number of areas that they wanted to improve. Um, and so they were looking at how they could change the way they dealt with the first call that was coming in. So they developed some conversation management techniques, which they used for their call takers to be able to try and take control of the calls and get the important information they needed from the call taker much more quickly than they were. Um, but they also changed the way they did the Thrive Risk Assessment. So previously they had a form where the call taker had to write out under each of the um, uh, areas of Thrive what the risk was um, in relation to those particular bits and a summary of their, their kind of judgment in each of those particular bits. And they were finding that that meant call takers would finish the call and then have to fill out that particular piece of the um, of the call log and then that would be shared with the dispatchers and it was right at the end of the call log and dispatchers wouldn't really necessarily get to it or look at it and would be making their own judgments on the summary of the call instead. Um, so this was really inefficient use of the call takers time and it was causing delays in how they were being able to pick up um, how quickly they were being able to get up to the next call. So um, interestingly, they were speaking to the people in their hostage, hostage negotiation team, and they were saying, well, actually, the FBI used a slightly different uh, technique, um, which looks at uh, trying to get some critical information into a very short um, amount of uh, kind of space and words, I suppose. And they call it summary assessment and response. So it's kind of trying to break down what you need somebody to know into those three particular areas. So South Wales Police decided to adapt this for how they were responding to calls, um, and they uh, created a kind of summary assessment and response uh, uh, part of their form, which sat at the top of the call log, um, so it would be the first thing that dispatchers saw. And it's um, limited to about 300 words, and it requires the call taker to just give an overall brief description of the incident, an assessment in their view of the harm and risk, um, covering the aspects of Thrive, but not having to detail what, um, what aspects, uh, what the information is for each of the Thrive um, areas, um, and then what their rationale is for the grade chosen and the grade uh, that they did choose. 
Um, so it's meant to be a very short, concise paragraph. So we did a, a work with them on the data that they'd already collected when they uh, rolled this out with the Quasile experimental designs. So they used one shift to call takers using the new SAR model, and all the rest of the call takers carried on doing what they were um, doing previously. Um, and very briefly, and um, we haven't finalised um, all of the work on this yet, and um, we're working with Angela Ruskin University on it, but it looks like uh, call duration reduced, so average call duration, so the actual talk time and the wrap time, that's the time the call taker spends after finishing the call, um, uh, trying to write up all the information that's needed and before they're free to take the next call. So the talk time and the wrap time decreased by, oh, well, it was one minute, 26 seconds shorter in the control group, uh, in the treatment group than in the control group. So it seemed to have an impact on average call duration. And it also had a, a, an impact on the call wrap time. So the time that they had to spend kind of completing the, the, uh, the log before they could hand it over to the dispatcher and before they would be free for another call decreased by one minute, was one minute and five seconds compared to the control group as well. So they, they seem to be, if you add that up over the totality of calls you're likely to get in a day, that's quite a big saving. Um, there seem to be also some modest benefits in call abandonment and regrade um, uh, outcomes. Um, and deployment times also seem to have some modest benefits. So officers were being deployed to the scenes by the dispatchers much more quickly than they were using the old route, partly because I think they had the information they needed um, right at the top of the form in a much more concise way and could make, make better decisions. And also there were some positive responses from uh, frontline officers who were saying that that kind of the information they then got through the log was much more concise and enabled them to understand the threat and um, the risk exposed to the, by the call that they were going to attend in a much more accessible way and they felt much more confident in how they could then deal with that call as well. Um, as I say, we're still uh, crunching the numbers on this a little bit, so they're kind of provisional findings, so they may change, um, but it's looking like this type of approach seems to be quite positive, um, which is uh, really good and I think will be of value for others who are trying to think about how they might change the way call takers take calls to speed up the process a little bit more. Um, so that's SAR. Uh, very briefly on ECHO, so ECHO uh, was a, is a, um, a tool used in Hertfordshire which is trying to um, drive up the effective, effectiveness and efficiency of um, how callers deal with um, victims when they're calling to report a crime. Um, and they're trying to automate the way they can collect information from victims um, around their kind of satisfaction and how they felt that call was dealt with. So it's an automated uh, text messaging system. So after somebody has called the police, they get an automated SMS sent back to them asking for them to fill out some kind of uh, tick box um, responses around satisfaction, but also has an online kind of feedback tool which has got, um, which you can put free text into, which they analyze using um, natural language processing capabilities. Um, and that data then pulls through into automated performance reports that then goes to supervisors um, to be able, for them to be able to understand whether there are any quality issues around individuals and how they're dealing with uh, members of the public, general trends in terms of satisfaction with how the calls are being taken, um, and areas where they might need to intervene early in order to kind of try to um, improve uh, performance across the piece. Um, this piece of work we, uh, we, we didn't do uh, an evaluation of because the data just wasn't there at the time. They haven't got the satisfaction data that they can then pull out to do comparisons with. Um, so we are working with them to develop a theory of change and a logic model and think about uh, understanding better the process that they um, have gone through to uh, develop this model and how it's put into practice, what's, what's working well, what's not working so well, um, and trying to think about how we might be able to develop a uh, evaluation structure around that. Um, but again, it's a, a way of trying to be much more dynamic in terms of understanding risk associated with performance in particular areas of the control room and being able to intervene early with that and try and um, mitigate those uh, risks as they're being identified. And the final one, um, nudging down burglary. So this is a classic nudge one, um, which is about using um, uh, techniques, uh, leaflets for uh, victims of residential burglary. I think in, this was in Durham, and it was mostly because they were having a problem with people not securing their homes appropriately. So a lot of the nudge was talking about how you can, reminding people how they can secure their homes and how they can try and um, improve um, their security locally um, in order not to be victims of burglary in the future. Um, we are, uh, we have got Sussex who are keen to replicate this. They have a burglary problem and they think this might be something they can um, use there. Durham did do quite a good evaluation of it, so we want to replicate it in Sussex and this is something we're hoping to take forward in this financial year. We were hoping it would be last year, but for various reasons um, it wasn't possible to take forward due to operational restrictions in Sussex, but they're still hoping to be part of it this year. So that was round one. 
Uh, round two, which we um, went through uh, just a couple of um, months ago, uh, has identified um, a number of other areas that we're now kind of keen to take forward for evaluation. Um, we've already heard about enhanced video response, um, and Stuart and Amanda mentioned the work that um, we're doing uh, with uh, Dorset to try and replicate that. Um, so we are uh, working with them, as I said, on, on developing the blueprint, but also then replicating it in some of the Southwest forces, and we will evaluate that. So this is a kind of a replication and an evaluation. Um, and alongside that, because uh, enhanced video response has got uh, efficiency savings around it, um, we are also providing some implementation support, or actually we're really um, buying out some of um, the time of the Dorset officers to go and work with Avon and Somerset to implement it there, so that we can start to actually share the learning from the officers about how you actually get this put into practice in a new force, um, and so they can learn as you go. And we're hoping to have a, um, people from another force who wants to roll it out to come into Avon and Somerset as well and work with um, the Dorset officers to be able to learn from them so they can take that back to their own force. So this is how we actually get that implementation support to try and stop that implementation failure that we know happens when things get picked up and shared somewhere else. Um, so that's the enhanced video res response. Um, we also uh, want to try and um, replicate and evaluate the work that you're going to hear about from Catherine uh, Bradley tomorrow um, on trauma support teams. So I won't talk about that one because she'll, she'll cover that tomorrow. Um, but we're hoping to develop an evaluation protocol uh, for that so that it's ready to go when we can find a replication site. It involves um, working in A&E, so we'd need um, uh, a hospital who is keen to do it as well. So it's kind of a complex one to get replicated, but we're really keen to try and do that. Um, and as I say, we're going to be ready to go with an evaluation protocol as soon as we've got the people who can do it. Um, the community mapping tool is a really interesting one. So this is run by a company called Vis-a-Vis, -vis, um, and they have a neighbor, uh, neighborhood alert tool, um, which is a secure web-based national community engagement tool. There are 33 forces who are signed up to it. I'm not sure they all know they're signed up to it um, because there's a massive resource there that they could use um, because you can put you can directly send messages out to people in your local community who have chosen to be registered on it um, and you can use that to um, either push out messages that you need them to know about activity you're taking in their area to build their confidence and, and trust but also you can use it to pull back um, information from them as well. They have a raft of data so they do a, a survey of all the people on um, that are registered onto their tool um, every couple of year, uh, every twice a year, I think actually, um, asking them all sorts of questions about confidence, satisfaction, um, engagement with the police, and various other things. And they also have lots of data about how the police forces are using it. So we want to do some kind of good secondary analysis of the data that they have, um, and maybe trying to do some uh, modelling to try and understand about how uh, different forces are using it and whether that seems to have different impacts on the levels of confidence um, uh, in their local communities. So that's quite an interesting. Uh, tool. If any of you knows Paul Quinton, um, who works at the college, who has done a lot of work on procedural justice and stop and search and various things like that, he got exceedingly excited by this. He thinks it's a kind of a really um, exciting opportunity for actually drawing in some of the evidence that you need to test some of the interventions you might be doing locally. So we're going to be pulling that together. I've had my two-minute warning. Um, I will speed up. Um, so the last one is risk matrices for victims and offenders. So there are a lot of risk matrices um, out there for uh, identifying uh, risky offenders or identifying who might be at risk of being uh, the next victim. Some of them have been tested but not many of them have been tested. Um, and I think there is something about uh, how we can start to assess the validity of these tools and how they're used in practice. Um, so we're developing um, uh, some work to actually start to try and evaluate some of the tools that we know are out there, probably focusing on knife crime and domestic abuse in the first instance. Um, so I think that will be an interesting one. And from there, we hope to also start to be able to kind of set out models for how you might go about testing these tools when they're being developed locally by forces. So that's the next set of things that we're evaluating, and it's going to be a con kind of continual thing that we'll keep putting to the What Works board. But I just wanted to finish very briefly on the research control strategy. So Andy Marsh, our CEO, um, her once has, has laid down the gauntlet to say, can you identify all the priority research questions um, that policing has, um, and maybe can you make them really, really kind of targeted so a master's student could pick them up and go and do a project on them, or a PhD student could pick them up and go and do a project on them, or actually, if they're really that big, we can get UK RI, UK um, research institutes to do, uh, to invest in actually creating a centre to deal with that particular area. So um, we, it's not really a, an easy task to do, but we're starting to try and develop what this research control strategy is going to be. 
Um, and we thought, let's start by looking at what, the, uh, what evidence we already have. So we've worked with Griffiths University from Australia, who have got the Global Policing Database, um, to develop our policing evidence gap map. So, uh, yes, a, a, Simon's cheering there, because it's, a, yeah, they're fantastic, and I don't think it's a, a resource that's used enough. Um, so they've mapped all the randomised control trials and systematic reviews into um, a, a huge tool, which you can drill into, and basically shows you where evidence exists. So the round circles are um, uh, randomised control trials, and the bigger they are, the more they are. Um, and it's looking at all sorts of policing outcomes against all sorts of policing interventions. So it's hopeful, it, we're hopeful that it will start to be able to map where we've got evidence. Um, actually, maybe we just haven't synthesised it, so we need to pull it together and get it out there for you to be able to use, and where we've got gaps in our evidence base, and we might want to actually start to try and drive research to fill those gaps. Um, we're going to share the evidence gap map um, on the college website when it's being finalised, so it will be a resource that all can use, and it will be fantastic for being able to identify new areas for systematic review, um, and as I say, also areas where we might want to do uh, further research. Um, and this is our complicated way of showing how we're going to do the research control strategy. Um, so the next step for us is to basically take the um, Office of the Police Chief Scientific Advisor's areas for research interest, which are quite broad, um, they will say themselves, um, uh, but they're trying to prioritise across policing where they think the big gaps are. But they've also done something called a problem book. So they've gone out to all of the national policing leads um, from the MPCC to start to ask them, what are your particular problems that you've got at the moment that you think are your priorities? Um, and we've also done our work previously about our college perennial problems. So we're kind of doing a top down and a bottom up approach to say, with those things, what are the kind of priority areas for policing? Map those against the existing evidence base from the evidence gap map and the crime reduction toolkit and any ongoing research we're aware of with, through our research map and the staff funded projects and the Home Office Research Programme, and then look to see where are the gaps. And then we're going to try and articulate what those gaps are in terms of research questions by uh, running kind of mini uh, groups with uh, officers and staff who are subject matters in that area to start to unpick and, and turn those gaps into questions that we can then push out both to academia, but also to policing um, with, the, with the gauntlet laid to fill those gaps. Um, so I thought I would leave on, end on that. Um, but please do upload all of your ideas and innovations to the Practice Bank, because that's the only way you will possibly get funding to evaluate them. You've got to be in it to win it, as they say in the lottery. But thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Neris. Please, uh, Governor Neris, afterwards. It's really difficult, isn't it, being a police leader at these conferences because you just go, I just want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that. And there's, there's something about how you pick what you want to do, but uh, really grateful. Yeah.